the biography of Jalaluddin Rumi and the history of the Mevlevi Order will be discussed in this video. Jalaluddin Muhammad bin Muhammad al Balkhi, or well known as Rumi, was a Sufi poet who until now is very famous throughout the world. He was born in Balkh but actually Vax on September 30th, 1207. His father, Bahauddin Walad, was a scholar of fiqh as well as an expert on Sufism. He even had been entitled Sultanul Ulama, the Sultan of Clerics. Around 1219, the family of Bahauddin Walad left Vax to perform the pilgrimage. On the way, they stopped in Nishapu, so there is an assumption that Fariduddin Attar met young Rumi. And he gave Rumi a copy of his book entitled Asronama, the Book of Mysteries. After performing the pilgrimage, Bahauddin Walad and his family went to Asia Minor. In Konya, they were warmly hailed by the ruler of the Seljuk, Alauddin Gaikubad, and his vizier, Muinuddin Parwana. It was in Konya that Bahauddin and his family settled and Rumi grew up. As reported by Chitik, since childhood, Rumi had mastered various disciplines including linguistics, jurisprudence, history, theology, poetry, astronomy, and philosophy. This is not surprising because his father was the Sultan of clerics who mastered various scientific disciplines. Rumi was educated by his father himself. Rumi's father, while in Konya, was appointed the headmaster of a madrasa. When his father died in 1231, it was Rumi who was appointed to take his position. We can say that Rumi at that time was like a professor in the madrasa. Indeed, since childhood, Rumi had been familiar with Sufism, but formally, he only did it completely when Burhanuddin al muhakkik a disciple of Rumi's father, came to Konya in 1232. Since then, Rumi, under the guidance of Burhanuddin Muhakkik, performed spiritual discipline until the death of his master in 1240. Afterwards, Rumi continued to carry out his duties as a professor there. In 1244, a monumental event occurred, namely Rumi met with Shamsuddin Tabriz. Then both had an intimate relationship that made Rumi neglect his duties at the madrasa, so that this made Rumi's disciple jealous. The relationship ended when Shamsuddin disappeared for the second time in 1247. It did make Rumi very depressed. He then looked for a friend and he was a goldsmith named Salahuddin Zarkub. Rumi's disciples were very jealous because according to them, it was inappropriate for a goldsmith to have a relationship with a great master. However, the relationship continued until the death of Salahuddin Zarkub in 1258. After the death of Salahuddin Zakub, Rumi had a close relationship with Husamuddin Shalabi, a disciple of Rumi himself and had also been a disciple of Shamsuddin Tabriz. Their friendship resulted in a great work, Mathnawi, which Abdurrahman Jami called excessively Quran in Persian. Husamuddin did encourage Rumi to create works that surpass those of Hakim Sanai and Attar. In addition, Husamuddin was his clerk who always listened to Rumi recite ecstatic poems. The friendship ended because of the death of Rumi. At evening on December 17, 1273, Rumi's funeral was attended by all the mourning residents of Konya, both Muslims, Jews, and Christians. In one of his poems, Rumi sings, those cry who parted at my burial. For me, this is the time of joyful meeting. Don't say farewell when I'm put in the grave. It is a curtain for eternal grace. Rumi left some works. His works include Makolati Shamsita Bris, which was the fruits of the close friendship between Rumi and Shamsuddin. Tivani Shamsita Bris, which is a collection of poems. Fihima Fihi, which is Rumi's work in prose, compiled from his lectures. Maktubat, which is a compilation of Rumi's letters to his relatives and disciples. Rubaiyat, which is Rumi's mystical poetry. And Mathnawi Maknawi a magnum opus of Rumi containing around 25,000 verses. Rumi's teachings are often understood to be central to love, ishq, and often contrasted with the philosophical view of Ibn Arabi. However, according to Saito Senasa, there was a continuity between Ibn Arabi's view and Rumi's view, whose transmitter was Satruddin al-Kunawi, a disciple and stepson of Ibn Arabi who was a close colleague of Rumi. 
In fact, some have called the Masnawi the Futuhat in Persian verse. However, for Shimon it was impossible because when Masnawi was translated into Ibn Arabi's philosophical framework, the result is bizarre. Moreover, the basic reason why Rumi made the goldsmith his spiritual friend instead of appointing Satuddin al Kunawi was that Rumi was not interested in the systematization conceptualized by Satruddin, the transmitter of Ibn Arabi. In addition to his works like Pauls in the Ocean, Rumi also left Sufi order, the Mevlevi order. The Mevlevi order, or in Arabic Maulawiyah, is the Sufi order attributed to Rumi, which was called by his disciples and followers Maulana, a title in honor of Rumi. Although Rumi was called Maulana, it is quite doubtful that since the beginning, the Sufi order had been called Maulawiyah. Ibn Battuta, who visited Konya in 1332, didn't call it Maulawiya, but Jalalia, taken from Rumi's name itself, Jalaluddin. Perhaps this Mevlevi order had started to gather and became the prototype of the established order at the time when Rumi was still alive. Shamsuddin al Afraki said that the activities of the Sufi order were in a meeting room, adjacent to Rumi's teaching place. It is very possible that the meeting room was adjacent to the madrasa that Rumi used during his lifetime as a place to teach his new disciples. That was where people can hear Rumi's lectures, people wrote and played rope up, and it was probably there where some ceremony, Sufi audition, was held. In addition, the madrasa that Rumi used to teach became a techie for his Sufi order, or later called Dargha. According to some scholars, the disappearance of Shamsuddin Tabriz made Rumi look for a new spiritual friend. Two or three years after Shams' disappearance, Rumi began a special relationship with Solahuddin Zarkub, who was a goldsmith. This relationship continued until the death of Solahuddin Zarkub. Rumi's relationship with him is considered to have been the relationship between Murshid and the caliph or successor. In other words, the appointment of Salahuddin Zakub as his spiritual friend was symbolically understood as the appointment to his successor. There is even an opinion that says that the whirling dervishes performed by Rumi was inspired by Salahuddin Zakub. After the death of Salahuddin Zakub, Rumi had a close relationship with Husamuddin Shalabi, who was his disciple. The appointment of Husamuddin as his successor may have seemed odd to Sultan Walad as Rumi's own son, who had not yet been appointed. However, the friendship inspired and prompted Rumi to start writing his magnum opus, Mathnawi, which later became the canonical book for the followers of the Mevlevi order. When Rumi died in 1273, Yushamuddin, who became his successor, was responsible for all the affairs of the order. Although previously Yushamuddin had come to Sultan Walad and asked him to replace his father as the spiritual guide. However, Sultan Walad didn't want to and still handed over the position to Husamuddin. Thus, at that time, the Moshid or the spiritual guide of the Mevlevi order was held by Husamuddin for approximately 10 years until his death in 1285. After the death of Husamuddin, the disciples then guarded around Sultan Walad and made him the successor of Husamuddin. Under the leadership of Sultan Walad, the Mevlevi order developed massively. Sultan Walad sent many caliphs throughout Anatolia. In addition, he was also the one who codified the rights and the rules of dress and behavior. Shimon also noted that the Mevlevi order became institutionalized by Sultan Walad, and later the ritual was elaborated. After Sultan Walad's death in 1312, the Mevlevi order was almost always led from generation to generation by his descendants. During the Ottoman Empire, the Mevlevi order became a Toriko that was widely embraced by the Ottoman elite. Meanwhile, at that time, there was also the Bektashi order, which was only embraced by the common people, including the Janissary. The Bektashi order was officially banned by the Sultan along with the Janissary. The Sultan seemed to have politically approached the Mevlevi order to confront the followers of the Bektashi order that affiliated with the Janissary against the Ottoman government. Many followers of the Bektashi order then turned to the Mevlevi order just to save themselves. The Mevlevi order was always centered in Konya, and many smaller techies were found all over the Ottoman Empire as far away as Egypt and Syria, although it never crossed the Ottoman borders. 
in 1654 during the reign of Sultan Murad, the activities of the Sufi order were founded by him. At the reign of Sultan Ibrahim, the order was spread across Istanbul and had three places. The close relationship between the Mevlevi order and the Ottoman court made the head of the order have the privilege of girding the Sultan with the sword. In fact, Sultan Abdul Aziz and Sultan Muhammad Roshad were the sultans of the Ottoman Empire who were listed as official member of the Mevlevi Order. According to Chitik, the Mevlevi Order had played a significant role in the history of the Ottoman Empire politically, spiritually, and especially culturally. The development of Turkish music is closely connected with the Mevlevi rites. During the reign of Sultan Salim III, the political role of the order became apparent because he himself was a Mevlevi dervish whose musical talents allowed him to compose the ritual music. In addition, many of the greatest Turkish calligraphers have been members of the order. Furthermore, Turkish poetry both thematically and stylistically owes much to Rumi's Persian poems. Unfortunately, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk banned Sufism and all the authors in Turkey on December 4, 1925. Thousands of Turks still honor Rumi by visiting the Mevlana Museum. As noted by Shimon in 1954, the Mevlevi order performed the whirling dervishes. In later years, the summer, the whirling dervishes became part of the annual celebrations held in Konya each December. In the second half of the 20th century, the Mevlevi order began to make its presence felt in the West. This was because of the immense popularity of English translation of Rumi's poems, especially by Coleman Parks. In 1971, they performed in London, and in 1972, they toured North America. After that, they performed in many places and are well known thus far. The Mevlevi order has two characteristics that distinguish it from other Sufi orders. First, the initiation process is so long for 1,001 days. Second, the sama ceremony is an important form of meditation. Indeed, some elements of sama can be traced back to Rumi, although the main features were added during the time of Adil Shalapi. Now we talk about the process of initiation, but we talk about it in general because I'm not a Mevlevi dervish. At the beginning of the initiation, a spiritual master or moshe tells a disciple to take a bath and return on another day. Then the disciple comes on the day with a CK dervish hat. The disciple kisses the hand of the moshe and sits on his left, facing the Kipla, while he is guided to recite the prayer of repentance. After that, the moshe places his hands on the hat brought by the disciple for the right, left, and front of the hat. Every time Surah al ikhlas is recited and blows on the hat. Then the Moshe comes the disciple and then takes an oath or payat to the disciple that he is acting on behalf of Maulana. Then the Moshe kisses the hat from the right, left, and front, then places it in top of the disciple. With both hands on the hat, he recites takbir. Next, the Moshe strokes the back of the disciple. Thus, he gets the name Muhib. A person who has been initiated in this order can choose whether to perform seclusion or khalwat for 1,001 days or not, and thereby not staying in Turkey or Lodge. If he chooses seclusion, then he will be able to become a deity or master in the order. A disciple who chooses to spend 1,001 days will be taken to the kitchen, handed over to the agitator or the cook to do the first test. The cook in this respect is not just working as usual, cooking food, because in Rumi's perspective, human beings are like vegetables that must be boiled in order for their soul to be cooked and softened. In the kitchen, which actually which is like a small room, the disciple is made to sit and suck a pustu made of cow height for three days without sleeping or talking. He is only allowed to perform prayers, go to the toilet, and eat the food served to him. There is an examiner who oversees the exam and assesses whether he can move on to the next practice. On the fourth day, he is taken to the bathroom to be bathed and cleaned, then given black clothes to wear during his seclusion. After that, he is handed over to the agitator, the cook, 
to get liquor, which must be read over and over while he carries out his daily tasks. Afterwards, the disciple is handed over to Kazanji Dede, who is responsible for his next education of the disciple as a dervish. The routine activity of the dervish is that during the day he learns to be a samak dancer or whirler with his dance master. In addition, his daily obligations are reciting dhikr and performing namaz, five daily prayers. If after a few days or months he breaks the rules, then he has to start over from scratch. Meanwhile, if he wants to become a musician, then he must obtain permission from his achidete or the cook and his kazanchi. After the Maghrib prayer, he should be in the main room of the Teki or lodge, a place where he is listening to his Moshe's lecture on Mathnawi. Regarding the whirling dervishes, he must pass the novice stage, which can usually take a long time to graduate from it before he is allowed to attend the main whirling dervishes, which is regularly held every Thursday night. After he successfully completed 1001 days, he is prepared in a small room. For the first three days, he is brought sweet food by his other colleagues. Now he becomes the deity and has the right to wear white clothes in the Mevlevi order. After reaching the deity level, he is given a choice whether he will stay in Teki or not. If he chooses to live in the Teki, then he cannot marry because women are not allowed to live in Teki. Now he has become a master and participates in the whirling dervishes weekly. However, if he chooses to live outside of the Teki, he is allowed to marry and come to Teki to participate in the weekly whirling dervishes, although he is not required to do so. Meanwhile, if a person is initiated but doesn't perform seclusion during 1001 days and stays in Teki, he is called Muhib. The Muhib is allowed to stay at home, but he has to come every day to the Teki to do intense training in the dervish practice from different masters, such as studying the whirling dervishes, music, and listening to Mathnawi lectures. He also takes an oath with a CK and is allowed to participate in the whirling dervishes. The Sufi orders in general have communal rights. The Mevlevi order has such unique rights. The Sama, popularly called the Sufi dance or the whirling dervishes, is a typical ceremony in the Mevlevi order. According to Shimon, where the Sama becomes the axis in the spiritual practice of the Mevlevi order is that most of Rumi's poems were created with the ecstatic sound of music. Music that Rumi, the creaking of the toes of paradise. Islamic scholars note that it was Sultan Walad made it a part of the rites of the Mevlevi order. Although it seems that the Mevlevi order was the first order officially making the Samad the official rights of the order, the Surah Hadiyah order which was founded earlier apparently had had the rights of the Sama. Abu Hafiz Umar Surawati, the nephew of Abu Najib Surawati, who served as the founder of the Surah Hadiyah order, conceded that the Sama could stimulate the disciples to draw closer to God. Therefore, for Abu Hafiz Umar Surawati, through music, God reveals himself to his servants without a curtain. As a matter of fact, one earlier generation, a Sufi from Khurasan, Abu Sa'id Abil Khair, who is considered to have been the initiator of the Khonako system and the ten former rules in it, is also recorded by historians to be a Sufi who gave former rules of the Sama that was held in his Khonako, which therefore played an important role in the spiritual practice of his disciples. Apart from it, Rumi himself even advised his disciples to perform the Sufi dance to increase feelings so that they were able to reach the peak of excitement. When a dervish performs the dance sincerely, he will be carried to the peak of happiness because his outward movements are the result of the overflow of happiness that is in his inward. Rumi asserts that the Sufi dance or the mystical dance is lawful for the lovers of God because it can illuminate and adorn the heart. According to Shima, the Sama appears in Rumi's poetry in various images. The Sama is depicted like a ladder to heaven, a ladder that be climbed by the longing soul to reach the roof where the beautiful beloved will be waiting. The Sama is much more than a time-bound ritual movement because in Rumi's eyes, the entire cosmos is described as the one that is busy with dancing and whirling, stamping its feet. Stamping on the ground can be interpreted as bringing forth the water of life and resurrecting the dead. At the occasion of the ceremonial Sama, usually held on Friday at noon 
After congregational prayer, the dervishes used to wear their special dress, namely the tenu, a white sleeveless frock, the stakul, a long-sleeved jacket, a belt, and a black khirko is worn as a mantle. The hands of the dervish must not be put on the khirko, but the black khirko must be removed before the sama started which means the process of rebirth by removing the cross eco. The head was covered by a high felt cap, usike, around which a turban cloth might be wound, showing the vertical aspect as a pivot that would of whispers of desire and lust. The hat or the cap, large tapus of brown felt, is a distinctive mark for members of the Mevlevi order. It represents the tombstone of the echo and as a reminder of the undeniable gates of the death. The ephemeral nature of the word Furthermore, the dervishes perform the dance by wearing a white coat that symbolizes the shroud, which means turning off their existence. According to Zhang Louis Mikan, during the session, the dervish sings, The frog is my tomb, the heart my tombstone. Why wouldn't a corpse dance in this word when the sound of the trumpet of death raised him to dance? The Sama ceremony is regulated by very strict rules. The Sama ceremony consists of seven parts. First, the dervishes take off their black cloak. It starts with Nati Sharif, a new lodge to the Prophet. Quotes at the onset and each stop of the Sama, holding his arms crosswise, he represents the number one and testifies to God's unity. While whirling his arms are open, his right hand directed to the skies, ready to receive God's beneficence. Looking to his left hand turned toward the earth, he turned from right to left around the heart. This is his way of conveying God's spiritual gift to the people upon whom he looks with the eyes of God. Revolving around the heart from right to left, he embraces all the mankind, all the creation with affection and love. Second, a drum voice which symbolizes God's creative command, Kun. Third, the improvisation taksim with a reed nay, symbolizing the first breath that gives life to all things. Fourth, the dervishes greetings to each other, symbolizing the salutation of soul to soul concealed by its shapes and bodies. Fifth, perform the sama, the whirling dervishes, which consists of four salutes. The first salute represents the birth of a dervish to truth by mind and feeling. The second salute expresses the dervishes rapture in witnessing to the splendor of creation. The third salute is the transformation of rapture into love. This is annihilation of self with the beloved. The fourth salute illustrates the ascension of the prophet to the throne of God and descending back to earth. Sixth, reading a Quranic verse, especially to God belong the east and the west. Wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. God is all encompassing, knowing. Seventh, as a closing by reciting a prayer for the repose of the souls of all prophets and all believers. Quotes gathered into an octagonal enclosure, the dervishes arrange themselves to dance in several concentric orbits, creating an image of the planets in the heavens, reproducing on earth the movements of the stars, themselves symbols of angelic powers and hierarchies. The dervish is conscious of participating in the universal harmony and of contributing to making the order that is in the skies reign here below. Giving himself up to the rhythm of celestial harmonies, he becomes an instrument through which divine love communicates with creatures suffering from separation and from the cosmic illusion. Through his rotation, he affirms the unique presence of God in all directions in space. Wherever you turn, there is the face of God. And he identifies himself with the center and omnipresent principle. As stated by Shimmer, if a dervish should become too enraptured, another Sufi who is in charge of the orderly performance will gently touch his frog in order to curb his movement. A dervish turning around his own axis is like the earth rotates itself, while his turning around the master is like the celestial planets moving around the sun. It represents subtle atoms or the dust specks that are attracted by the gravitational force of spiritual love. The ceremony of the whirling dervishes ends with sonorous prayer and a deep call. from whom everything comes and to whom everything will return. Oh come, oh come, you are the soul of the soul of the soul of worldly. Oh come, 
You are the cypress tall in the blooming garden of whirling. Oh come, for there has never been and will never be one like you. Come, one like you have never seen the longing eyes of whirling. Oh come, the fountain of the sun is hidden under your shadow. Come, come.